Okay, so you know after imagining the big picture, the dedicated processor, you can now go into every single component there. For example, uh, you can go back to study the debouncing filter, or you can go back to studying the, the other one, the RS flip-flop, which was in P5, right? Or you may pay attention if, if it is possible for you to, uh, to imagine how is going to be the, the data path, because here it is the most important component, okay? So here you are, a picture of this, okay? Uh, let's uh, start commenting some details and uh, in, in some way or another to make you available this picture easier, right? And so you see one thing is a picture like this which can be, you know, uh, designed using several sheets of paper and going on and on, trying and trying until it gets some meaning. For example, here you are that the most important chip here is the chip 1, right? The chip one is the, the shift register because the idea here is to load the pools and then after loading the pools, you know, pushing the bits to the right, shifting them to the, to the right like this, bit by bit, so the frame is generated. So the right serial output becomes the pools out, the data out from the general architecture of a finite state machine, okay? So the chip one, is the most important one. This idea, load and shift, or do nothing, you know, very well. When, when you don't have to use this device, you are not going to do anything at all. So, zero, zero, in frame control, you see, you have to invent a name like this, frame control, so you are going to control the way the frame is generated. Load and shift bit by bit. You know, and here you see the, the opportunity of the clock frame squared. That's the one that is going to go uh, running this device, you see? And that's a complication because the problem is like that. In some way there is the system clock and then there is the, the other clocks that has to be used for a special devices, okay? And in this case, to generate the frame, it was stated that every pulse or every beat indeed, whatever it is, zero or one, is going to last for 1.25 milliseconds and this means that every clock period you have a different bit okay a different bit shifted to the right and this means that the corresponding frequency here the clock frequency square is this one of uh, you know 1.6 kilo air all right so you know it's about uh, shifting bits but then the next important chip here is absolutely, it is the chip 3, you know, the counter modulo 16, because how, which is the length of the frame? The length of the frame is 16 bits, so probably you have to do that thing of shifting bits to the right, 16 clocks at the same rate, you see, uh, with the same period, the clock frame squared. So this is why you are going to enable the pulse generation, that, that which is going to mean this thing of let's generate pulses to the output, bit by bit. So, you know, you may imagine very well that you can use a counter modulo 16 that is going to give you, the code is not important here, so it's going to be an internal signal connected to nowhere, QP is just the name so that you can be able, it is going to be able for you to, to run the VHDL translation. So the, the important signal here is TC16, the one that is, you know, it, it is be, can be named like this, enable the frame flag. Yeah, it's, it's complicated to choose the names as well. So uh, what, what is the meaning of this? Well, so in some way or another, the control unit will allow the shifting bits in the shift register for 16 clocks. So when this shifting to the right is going to stop? Well, after 16 clocks. So this is why you have to count 16 clocks like this. When you have a, a pulse 
when 15, this means that 16 clocks of this frequency has been elapsed, so this means the, the end of the frame and the starting of the delay, okay? So this signal is going to be a status signal that goes from the data path to the control unit, so the control unit is going to be able to change the states, because it's not going to be any more shifting, but starting the delay. All right, one second, two seconds, whatever it is the case. So that's the point. All right. This is why you may like to use a counter modulo 16 here, uh, where, you know, you are only using it counting up. So up and down can be connected all the time to one and load all the time to zero. In this way, the data in is not going to be used here in this application. But because that's the advantage of using a universal counter. You can then connect the control inputs of this device, whatever you like. And for example here, the only important thing is this count enable or do nothing, you see? Using or not using this device, okay? When you are not liking to use this device, count enable is going to be zero. So the control unit is going to generate a PGE equal zero for many states. But for some states, the PGE is going to be 1, so the frame can be pushed to the right, to, to the end, okay? Another device which is convenient here is this data register 19 bits, or if you like, a 16-bit register and then a 3-bit register. Why? Why you like to have this? Because, you know, this is related to the sampling of the data, and the data is both the pulse conformation, the ones and zeros that is going to generate the pattern of the frame, and the delay, one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, so this is the input data, so you see, you have a kind of a load data, another control input that is going to be convenient for capturing the P and the delay, as you saw yesterday or you saw the other day in the, in the state in the timing diagram, right? So you load the P and the delay, and that means that if the user changes the P and the delay, meanwhile the machine is working, nothing is going to happen, okay? It is like if you've got a, a dishwasher or a printer, and you are changing the configuration of the program for washing, and nothing happens, because this is not going to be taken into account until a uh, next cycle starts. That's convenient, so you see? So you, you program a given frame with a specific data from P and delay, and only when this cycle ends, now it's time to start a new sampling for the next frame to be sent. That's the point of a data register. It's kind of a memory that stores internally the values that are there for P and D at the beginning of the cycle. And finally, there is this thing of the delay calculation. How it is possible for you to calculate a real-time delay. You know the meaning of real-time? One second. Okay, so how can you calculate one second time? or uh, six second time. How can you do that? If you think about it, it is possible to use again a counter modulo 16 but adapted for another modulo. For example, a counter modulo 1 million, you see, like that. In a way that now you can load a value here and make the counter go down all the time. And when zero, you have a flag again. So you see, that's the kind of idea. You load a given value here in binary, and then with a different clock this time, you see, you can choose that here. So this is going to be the system clock, the 100 kilohertz clock, you see. So you can go down counting the initial number that you have preset in the counter. And when zero, you have this, hey, it's zero flag, right? time delay flag. And again, this time delay flag can be used by the control unit to go ahead, okay? To go advancing. 
and in this way practically everything is explained all right except perhaps the rom the rom you know what is the rom for so here is where you have to take your calculator and program the one two three four five six seven seconds so which is the right number to be applied in this counter so that after reaching zero you have a one second two second and three seconds that, that is the, the the thing so the seven numbers because the zero is not used the zero is going to mean in some way or another that the machine do not have to go cycling this uh, periodically but you know a single frame these numbers has to be stored for example in a rom you input here the number six so the corresponding number for timing six seconds is generated and so you know so what the control unit can do that operation of loading the number the first thing to do load the number this is presetting the timer you see this is really really a timer this for timing a given period of time so this is what is going to do the 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 finite state machine the control unit is going to load the number first and then second is going to allow the counting the don't counting until the machine goes to zero all right so this is a kind of a large picture and detailed and i think that very well annotated of every single input and output where it has to be connected you see what is a port it is uh, drawn in blue and what is an internal signal, you know, it is in black. So that is also convenient. You see, chip 1, chip 2, chip 3, chip 4, chip 5. And this is just uh, an architecture for the starting the problem. Probably then it is not good to work at all or something is going to be wrong. And probably when this is already implemented, you have to go through the steps of testing and debugging and to see if the, in the end it is going to work or not okay so that that's the idea so now that the data path has been explained we can go into the pulse generator the structure to see which is the which are the main parts of this device okay so this is something that you can now uh, watch here in the architecture because after the picture of the of the data path you've got here another picture which is essentially the top entity pulse generator right in one hand in one hand you have data in this is the data in okay the p and the delay this is the data out that is going to be processed by this machine the data path now it is known that has low data control signal and then the frame control signal and then the pulse generation enabled and then the delay enabled and then load delay time okay in the counter so that the delay can be started and well these many signals and as well as the flag for the time delay and the enable frame flag those signals are going to be interfacing the control unit right so the control unit is going to be a finite state machine that is going to be capable of both generating, you know, the control signals for the data pass and generating these two or three, you know, these, the control signals for the data pass, another control signal for this uh, one bit memory cell, and then it is going to generate a couple of signals that are going to be accessed by the user one is going to be the lady intermittency and the other is going to be the pulse which is going to mean the end of a cycle right that's the idea so 
what is accompanying the control unit? Well, basically the clock generator, all right? That has the function to implement the one earth, the two hundred earth, okay? For the the bouncing filter, and then the one point six kilohertz signal for the frame pulses and then the system clock which may be for example 100 kilohertz to set a value it may be one mega or doesn't matter the frequency in which the system is going to go ticking and apart from the clock generator because you have a star signal here you see you have a button and the button can generate uh, can generate bone things on the transitions you have to clean these and generate the very well established pulse and this is the function of the debouncing filter and then this pulse has to be recorded for a while right not if you like to start because this is going to happen immediately when you click the button the machine is going to start but finally when the machine is running periodically you know generating frames periodically you know another click here another click is has to be saved here has to be saved in order to stop the machine when the last timing period ends that's the general architecture okay and you know you have some electrical circuits as well here the oscillator for example for generating 50 megahertz and then the last one is the most important one at all, you know, the power on reset. That's the one that is going to initialize the machine to, for example, the idle state. So now if you understand more or less the big picture of everything related to the hardware, you know, if this is clear now, okay, if this is clear, what goes next is the most important thing here. What the control unit is going to do to generate the many signals, to control the data path, to generate the output signals and the clear flip-flop signal. How, how is that possible? Well, because you know, the next uh, circuit or the next structure to this queue is the finite state machine I mean the CC1, the CC2, and the state register capable of solving this system. And that has to be because you have a kind of a state diagram in mind. So what kind of a state diagram you may be thinking of, right? That's the next thing to, to grasp in this exercise before going to the developing and testing stages, you know? Right? Perhaps to finish this planning section is a good idea to explain in detail or just to, to review how the debouncing filter works and why this latch, this flip-flop here, okay? So basically the idea is that you've got here a mechanical device which is going to generate noise when you click, right? So if you click this you know, if you click this, uh, you are going to generate noise. So this is the PBL, you know, the input of this uh, debouncing filter, the P, the push button active law is going to be like this. Because, you know, here you have this kind of stuff, uh, noisy device, noisy transition when you click and then similar when you release. When you release the button, you've got this kind of effect, and this is when you click the button, okay? That's the point. So the opposite of this is something, uh, something like this that you see uh, in the input of the debouncing filter, okay? So if you like to see this in time, it's going to be, you see, all the time zero, so now all the time one, 
So anytime you, you have some noise here and then the signal is stable because you are clicking and then you release and that's the way it works, okay? So this means click and this means release. Okay, right. So what, what is going to happen here? Well, the clock that is sampling the PBL signal is the clock for the debouncer, which is 200 uh, so it's about 5 milliseconds in period time. So, you know, this signal is sampled that way, okay? And if you go back to P6 and you, uh, you examine how this debouncing filter is designed, you know, when zero, nothing happens. When two zeros, nothing happens. But then perhaps here you are an unknown value and here you've got a zero. So if you've got three zeros, I guess that I remember, if you've got three zeros, you know, the QA is generated. So you see up to this point, zero, zero, zero. When you get three zeros consecutively, you have a pulse and the pulse is of a duration of a single clock so this is the key way right doesn't matter if you are still clicking or releasing doesn't matter because three zeros has been detected consecutively this means that all this previous noise has been filtered and so you've got a perfect pulse here the qb is the same but not no use it in this application the qb is very similar but it is kept high, not for a single period, you know, but meanwhile you are clicking. When you release, the QV goes down. So that, that is the QA, like this, and QV is very similar. So if, if you like QB, not for this application, but if you think about QB, it's the same idea of sampling values, you see, at the rising edges, and when two ones are detected, for example, here you are still detecting something that is not known, but here you are detecting a one and here another one. So the QV is very similar, but it goes high at this point and then it goes low when two ones are detected. That is the way this device works, okay? The debouncing filter. So two clean and very well known and synchronized pulses to the uh, clock debouncing filter, but then that's okay. You, you know this kind of pulse is okay for the system because it's perfect. It's a perfect pulse. And what happens with this pulse? This pulse is sampled continuously by means of this reset RS flip flop. Okay, that is what is happening here. The QA is sampled, but you know with a different clock, a clock that has a different period. Ten microseconds only so for every five milliseconds you have a lot of tiny pulses belonging to the other clock so the other clock if you represent it it's impossible it's going to be something like this when you run that in the bhdl modulator you have a thumb all taking into account so 20 or 30 pulses for the debouncing filter the other one cannot be seen you see the other one is too compact and it is seen like this, you know, it is not seen. It is here, but just a continuous line. In order to see something, you have to zoom at the given transition. For example, here, this is right. At this transition, you know, or around this pulse, which is five milliseconds, you know, this is 5,000 microseconds. So divided by 10, 500, you know. So th this tiny pulse indeed is about 500 small pulses in this clock. So if you have to represent them, these are very tiny small pulses, every one of them with a rising edge. So you see this key A, this QA is sampled at the very highest speed by the second device here, okay? The RS flip-flop. And what is the point of this device here? Well, the first time that the one is sampled by this other clock, you know, the first time that this device is sampled with the one, the, the other signal, the one that is applied to the control unit, you know, the star button signal, you know, the star button signal 
is set high. That's the point. So the first time that the one is detected, this one is set high. And it's kept high forever. It's kept high forever unless, you know, from the control unit, okay, a signal is sent. So uh, what is going to be this signal? Well, a teeny pulse, you know. A teeny pulse is going to be sent when necessary, when the control unit finds it necessary. And that way, you know, a pulse is going to be generated to reset this signal. But meanwhile, unless there is this clear uh, flip-flop signal, this teeny pulse, you know, this 10 because it's going to be a state, and a state, you will have an state which is going to be that name, clear flip-flop, because the start has been recognized, so it is better to clear the flip-flop so that this signal, QA, and the start button may be sensitive to the next click of the external push button, which is when you like to stop, all right? So the clear flip-flop is going to come from the control unit going to be this uh, teeny 10 microseconds pulse that is going to be enough for resetting the STB. So any time later, you know, uh, the STB, who knows when, this is up to you to decide, any time later, you know, this signal STB is going to be reset. And this is because of the pulse from the control unit. Okay, this pulse is the one that uh, is generated, you know, uh, in the clear flip-flop. So that's the way it works. It's quite, you know, you have to pay attention to this in some way or another. It's about, it is here in this P8, because now it's up to you to see what is going to happen if you have a finite state machine? You see, this is the kind of a last idea here. What is going to happen if you have a finite state machine or you have something like this that is running synchronously very well, but with two clocks of different frequencies? So, as you see, for an introductory course, that is okay. It is uh, almost the end, you know. Uh, this, uh, you know thinking about how a machine with two clocks may work it's a good ending for this chapter two right so here you are these ideas so that now what goes next after this brief introduction into the architecture and the data path and the extra specific circuits to interface external push buttons and the like you know what goes next is the diffusion of the state register so it's up to you okay let's see if you are able to generate the kind of a state register that is going to control this pulse generator right so that's all